One of the most self-destructive memes in Bitcoin is the idea that a particular ticker symbol represents a network that is the real Bitcoin, to the exclusion of all other networks and their communities. Certain individuals go even further, claiming that any community beside their own, which claims to even be so much as a version or variant of Bitcoin, is a scam. This behavior is not novel in any way. We see its analog in many aspects of the human experience. Although it is in many ways unavoidable, adopting this position in the context of permissionless peer-to-peer -peer networks and their associated communities is not a path toward positive growth. In fact, such behavior is evidence of a bug in the human psyche. If we want Bitcoin to grow to be peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash for the entire world, we need to patch this fatal flaw in our own individual minds. For most of the last million years, during the crucial period of human biological and cultural evolution, our ancestors organized themselves in three fundamental groupings. The first grouping was immediate family. Fathers, mothers, aunts, uncles, grandparents, and first cousins all fall within this grouping. You share a high percentage of your genetic makeup with these individuals. In fact, you share half of your genetic lineage with your first cousins. That's the same amount that you share with one of your parents and any of your parents' full siblings, your aunts and uncles. In Richard Dawkins' seminal work, The Selfish Gene, the book which introduced the word meme to the common lexicon, Dawkins asserts that our biological imperatives are expressions of our genes' desire to reproduce themselves into future generations. In terms of your genetic self-interest, you are highly aligned with your immediate family. The second social grouping is the clan. A clan is a grouping of families, generally related through marriage, such that individuals within a certain generation may not share genetic material with one another, but they have shared genetic interest in the next generation. In-laws and second cousins are members of your clan. The final grouping of the traditional human organizational model is the tribe. Your tribe includes your family and clan, but it also includes individuals not related to you by blood or marriage. A tribe could be called a grouping of distinct clans, sharing a common dialect, history, and set of traditions. Tribes form as a type of mutual aid society. Tribal members are incentivized to reciprocate support for one another across a long period of time. It is in the tribal organizational framework that the bug in the human psyche becomes apparent. In the 1990s, anthropologist Robin Dunbar found a correlation between primate brain size and average social group size. His theory, now widely accepted, is that human brain size limits the number of stable relationships that any individual can maintain to about 150 people. Dunbar explained it informally as, the number of people you would not feel embarrassed about joining uninvited for a drink if you happen to bump into them in a bar. Both family and clan can generally fit within this limit known as Dunbar's number. The tribe, on the other hand, does not. That means tribes include strangers. Humans were incentivized to have a high level of trust for members of their own tribe, but they also had to be able to quickly distinguish between members of their own tribe and members of other tribes. Failure to do so was potentially a death sentence for our ancestors. Studies of Native American tribal names show that most had an original meaning comparable to human, people, or us. The tribal name for itself was often the localized ethnic self-perception of the general word for human being. This pattern is common throughout the world. For our ancestors, anyone that wasn't in their tribe wasn't even a real human being. Such an outsider was the other. Many tribes had a tradition of simply killing any other they encountered. Our instinct for separating us from them, our instinct for tribalism, is woven deep into our DNA. At one point in our evolutionary history, this instinct was fundamental to our survival. In the context of a modern, global civilization, where we can encounter and interact with thousands of strangers on a daily basis, this instinct for tribalism is as much a burden as a blessing. At the same time, we cannot help but be tribal, and to deny our drive to separate into us and them is to deny our humanity and our genetic heritage. 
As individuals, we are drawn to adopting certain symbolic adornments that mark us as a member of a certain tribe. When a person wears a piece of clothing with their favorite sports team's logo, they are making a tribal identification. When someone puts a sticker for their favorite band on their laptop, they are signaling tribal membership. When a Twitter user adds a Bitcoin B or a lightning emoji to their username, they are expressing their desire to be part of us and separate from the other. Although one can make endless justifications for why their chosen community represents the real Bitcoin, those statements are all simply rationalizations of a desire for tribal membership. That markets choose to identify a particular network with a particular ticker symbol does not make that network the real Bitcoin. That a particular network is more usable as peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash, reflecting the title of the white paper, does not make that network the real Bitcoin. That the code base of a particular lead implementation is closer to the first code base released by Satoshi doesn't make the network running that set of consensus rules the real Bitcoin. The Bitcoin tribe, if Bitcoin is to change the world and bring more financial sovereignty, will need to expand to include billions of souls. We, the Bitcoin tribe, are those who use Bitcoin. We are those who believe that Satoshi Nakamoto's revelation represents a paradigm shift for humanity. We are those who seek to increase the size and scope of the Bitcoin network and community. If we accept the core tenets upon which Bitcoin is based, then we, as Bitcoiners, don't believe that any individual has the authority to tell another which rules represent consensus or what network they can and can't join. The instinct for tribalism is unavoidable. In many contexts, it is positive. It is a way for us to bind ourselves in a community of like-minded people and build a new tomorrow. It is only in recognizing this drive for what it is that we can use the gifts of our ancestors towards the betterment of humanity and search together for the hidden truths of Bitcoin still left to be discovered.